Hey everyone, this week I thought I would give a bit of an off-the-cuff video uh, because I just completed reading Ron Miscavige Sr.'s new book called Ruthless, uh, which is about him and his son David Miscavige, who is the current leader of Scientology, and um, it's a bit of a memoir about uh, Ron's life and uh, how David came to be and uh, growing up, uh, you know, how he was as a child how he got into the C organization, um, how they both did, and um, Ron's experience with David Miscavige as David became the uh, leader of Scientology and eventually um, became not such a nice guy. This book represents the most direct frontal assault on David Miscavige that's ever been launched. Jenna Hill Miscavige's book, um, she being David Miscavige's niece, uh, was, you know, was definitely telling because she is a Miscavige in, the, you know, in that family. But this book is about David Miscavige directly. And, uh, and he's never been uh, put in the spotlight quite this way, nor quite by somebody of this stature in his family. I mean, to have your own father write a book about you. That's quite something, and I think that the um, reaction from Scientology tells you pretty much everything you need to know about how freaked out they are about this. You know, when Going Clear came out last year, uh, Alex Gibney and Lawrence Wright's, you know, I thought brilliant documentary on the subject of Scientology, the church didn't react anywhere near the way that they are reacting to this book. There was a New York Times ad placed before the Sundance Film Festival, and that, of course, did more to launch, uh, you know, PR about the movie than anything that HBO or Alex Gibney were doing. And so, you know, at Sundance, the Going Clear um, premiere was uh, greeted by, you know, capacity crowds, standing room only, and it was the talk of Sundance because of the church's reaction to it. So you'd think that they would learn from that experience. You'd think they would learn from all the previous foot bullet PR ham-fisted moves that they've made to not keep doing that, but they keep doing it. And I mentioned, I talked about this last week in a video that I made about Scientology's desperate media tactics. And if you haven't seen that, I, I really recommend that you do. Um, because I was glad to see that I nailed it, <laughs> you know, as, terms, as far as them not learning from their own mistakes and, in fact, doubling down on them. Uh, okay, well, Ron Miscavige Sr., for example, was on 2020 last week, and the church tried to make that go away before it ever happened. They sent, uh, out what, I've, what I've read, what I heard, was that they sent um, Jenny DeVock and, uh, or Jenny Linson, rather, and uh, Mark Yeager down to the ABC studios. They wouldn't go on camera, but they talked for hours to the ABC people trying to get them to not do the show by claiming that Ron Miscavige Sr. was this and was that and was the other thing and it was all just a pack of lies and none of it was true and da 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 And of course that went nowhere because ABC had already invested in doing this thing and were moving forward on it and the church didn't really have any leverage to use to make ABC not do it. Well, then they trot out Monique Yangling, who is the Church of Scientology's tax attorney. She is a high-powered tax attorney from Washington, D.C. Her and her husband, who is now, I, I believe, deceased, are, were very, very powerful tax attorneys and, the, and were hired by the church back in the 80s and have been on the church's payroll ever since. And Monique Yingling has been trotted out from time to time as a church spokesperson or, you know, statement giver uh, to refute various media or reporter efforts to talk about, say, tax exemption and things like that. And now, well, you know, Scientology hasn't had a media representative or spokesperson since Tommy Davis was last seen uh, representing the church back in 2011, I think it was, so five years. Uh, you know, that itself should tell you quite a bit about the state of Scientology and how um, disrupted and disorganized things are internally at its highest levels. 
You know, everything that I talk about, or hardly most everything, rather, that I talk about when I talk about Scientology is I'm talking about it at its highest levels. The day-to-day -day Scientologists are regular people, just like you and I, who are trying to do some good for themselves and do some good for the world, and they go around and they pass out anti-drug literature, and they try to do mentoring at schools or try to, you know, spread Hubbard's words about illiteracy and, and study and things like that. Uh, or, you know, very, very misinformedly <laughs> try to talk about uh, getting people off drugs through the church's very destructive Narconon program, which they think works miracles. And they're really just trying in an honest, honest effort to do good. And, and very little of what I say about Scientology applies to Scientologists at that level. But when you start looking at the real nuts and bolts of Scientology and, and the, the, the men behind the curtain, so to speak, and, and David Miscavige, you're looking at a disorganized mess and a, and a real madhouse of, of lies and deceit and outright fraud. And that, and of course, physical violence and the enforcement of disconnection, which is the most toxic sci uh, Scientology policy that, that exists. So. So they trot out Monique Yingling because David Miscavige, as far as I can tell, doesn't trust anyone in the sea organization, the upper levels of Scientology. He doesn't trust any of them to go out and do a good job of speaking for the church or speaking in his best interests. Nor will he come out and speak. And that itself should also be telling. The guy hasn't actually come out on media and spoken uh, on video, on camera, since I think 1992 or something, on Ted Koppel Nightline. I know he gave, a, he gave a news story to the Tampa Bay Times, I think in the late 90s, and that's it. The guy is a recluse, and he only comes out to speak at carefully monitored and stage-managed events that he is 100% in charge of. So that should tell you something about where his head is at and how afraid he is of actually being found out for, you know, the kind of person that he really is. So anyway, they trot out Monique Yingling and, um, and she did an absolutely horrible job. Uh, I, I just universally panned. Uh, every comment section I saw on every video replay of the 2020 uh, interviews or the show, um, everything I could find, not just in the ex-Scientology world, but in the world at large, spoke volumes about what a bad job she did. So um, so they're moving forward with this campaign against Ron Miscavige. And I just, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because um, it's a very concerted effort on the part of the church to stop this book to, and now that they can't stop the book, now that it's out, to try to discredit Ron Miscavige Sr., who has, um, you know, been a part of the Church of Scientology for as long as I was. For 27 years, he worked for the church. And he worked at its highest levels, at its highest, highest levels. And uh, now they have to somehow pretend that he's a really bad guy, that everybody hated, never got along with, never wanted to have anything to do with. He was nothing but, you know, um, a horrible, awful, hateful person who, uh, you know, never did any good and all of this, right? Which, of course, there's plenty of evidence to counter all of that. So... Uh, you know, they, the, everything they do in order to discredit him only discredits themselves. I was shocked to find a photo on TMZ where they, they very poorly photoshopped an armband on a picture of him with a swastika on it and tried to put out that he was a Nazi sympathizer or something. I mean, this is really bad stuff. But most importantly so far, just in the last few days, not only have they put out a full website with you know, all these testimonials and, and videos and whatnot about how bad he is, but they also put up a screenshot of what, is, um, what looks to be his own handwriting where he is admitting to you know, doing what he said he, he did on the 2020 episode where he, he hit his wife, his ex-wife, Loretta. Uh, and he talks about that in the book, and he talks quite candidly about it. But the, 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 th the telling thing, the reason why it's so telling that the Church of Scientology is printing a screen, a, a photo of 
him writing this in his own handwriting is because that information, that when you write those things down within the church, that's confidential. That's priest penitent privileged information. It goes into a folder that is clearly marked priest penitent privileged information. And so they have just proven by their own actions that they don't care at all about their own confessionals or the sanctity of them or the confidentiality of them. So, you know, we've talked about that as critics for a long time, but the Church of Scientology just handed us 100% proof that they violate the priest penitent privilege whenever they feel like it. So, you know, another foot bullet as far as they go. Uh, it needs to be noted that the real target of this PR campaign that they're waging against Ron Miscavige is actually Scientologists, existing Scientologists. This website they put up, you know, I don't know that they really think that a lot of people are going to give that much traction who aren't in the world of Scientology, but they will direct all Scientologists to it. And here's the thing about Scientologists. When you're in the Scientology mindset, or any destructive cult mindset for that matter, you want to believe that your group is on the side of good. You want to believe that you've invested in something with your time and your money and your effort that, that you haven't wasted your time, that you are justified in doing what you're doing. So it doesn't generally take a lot to convince a Scientologist that a critic such as myself or Ron Miscavige Sr. is a bad person, is a horrible person. And of course, you can use L. Ron Hubbard's own writings to show that anybody who's being critical of the church is, you know, somebody with misdeeds and bad actions. And the church uses that to their advantage to keep people in that mindset. So they've been circling the wagons for a long time. I mean, Anonymous came out in 2007, huge public blow to Scientology's credibility. And a lot of Scientologists had to notice that. They couldn't help but notice it, especially with all those protesters walking round and round the Scientology buildings, you know, for a year or two with all those protests that were going on. So that, that sort of started this ball rolling of very wide public or Scientologist recognition that something was rotten, you know, in Denmark. And, um, and they had defections as a result. They've had a lot of defections as a result. Mike Rinder coming out, Marty Rathman coming out, speaking out openly. Then there was Debbie Cook's email, and that was huge. But I believe that Ron Miscavige Sr.'s book is going to be uh, have the effect sort of, of Debbie Cook's email on steroids. It's going, to be, it's going to be gigantic in the world of Scientology, especially with the C organization and with Scientology staff members. Because Ron Miscavige Sr. would tour around while he was a Sea Org member, and especially the Sea Org bases. We all knew him. I knew him. People knew him. He was always a personable, relatable, easy to talk to person when he came down. And I've talked with other C or their ex Sea Org members who related to me that uh, that Ron Miscavige Sr. was always the best person to talk to from the people who came down from Ant management because he didn't have an attitude. He didn't have an air. He didn't have this uh, authoritarian sort of idea or, or attitude uh, with himself. He was always just very down to earth. And, um, and that, that really said a lot for him and for his character, right? And so, of course, you know, we all believe him. And the people who knew him who were in Scientology, and there were lots and lots and lots of them, they're going to have a real hard time believing that he was a Nazi or that he was this horrible, awful person who never did anything good, right? Because they saw him. They heard him. They heard his music. They saw him on stages at the events uh, with the Golden Era musicians, right? And so his, his credibility factor within the world of Scientology is quite high. And so this, this PR effort to discredit him goes out to the world at large but it mostly goes to existing Scientologists. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of correspondence with people who, were, uh, def who, has, who have defected over the last few years. 
from Scientology. They reach out to me. They tell me that I've helped them, that other critics have helped them, that they that the church itself, you know, was not doing itself any favors in all of the bad press it was putting out against its critics and whatnot, and that drove them out, as well as, of course, all the internal, um, you know, human rights violations and and uh, money, you know, the, 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 the grubbing for money and all of that stuff just drove them out, right? So, um, so that's been going on for quite a while, and and you might have noticed on my channel that a lot of the work I've been doing lately, uh, in interviewing Rachel Bernstein and Joe Zimhart and people like that, has been an effort to help those people because they reach out to me and go, well, how do I recover? How do I help my friends? How do I help my family? And that's that's been that effort. So um, now, as far as the book itself goes, it's a good book. It's a great memoir. It, um, it definitely gives you a very good idea of Ron Miscavige Sr.'s life, how he got into Scientology, how what he was looking for, um, where his head was at, and, and how he got convinced through, you know, actual uh, good works that Scientology did with him, with uh, less so with his ex-wife, and with his family, with David. There's a story that he relates about David Miscavige and his as, asthma as a child, and how Scientology didn't cure it, but certainly reduced its traumatic effects on him as a child and almost made it totally go away. And that's pretty interesting. That's an interesting story. And I'm not going to sit here and refute it and say it didn't happen or, you know, something like that, because it very clearly did. Um, that leads me, of course, to the fact that there's a lot of, um, I guess what I would say is apologetics towards Scientology as a subject. Within the book, there's a lot of um, commentary and, um, and talking about how Scientology as a subject is, is basically a good thing. He clarified, I watched uh, Ron Miscavige give an interview the other night uh, on Seth Andrews' uh, show, news show, and Miscavige clearly stated that Scientology at its lower levels is pretty good stuff, but the upper levels is pretty much a sham. And I can see why he would say that. Um, and I've said, you know, similar things in that you can get results with some of the common sense principles and some of the lower level stuff because it hooks you and gives you some fairly simple um, problem solving techniques and, um, you know, a fairly workable um, therapeutic technique if used in a limited way. I'm talking about Dianetics right now or basic simple Scientology processes, right? These things uh, have a limited degree of workability on a limited number of people, not universal. And uh, Ron Miscavige Sr. was one of those people, right? So he sings its praises. Um, but he also takes care, and I really appreciated this in the book, to cite the fact that L. Ron Hubbard drew from lots of different sources that came before him and didn't credit those sources. And that is very, very true. And he actually named some sources that I hadn't heard of before myself, which I actually liked because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking some of those up. So it's not fully um, coming across as the work of an independent Scientologist or somebody who uh, is eager for people to do Scientology or something like that. It, it reads like an honest account of somebody who really feels like they got gains from the subject, wants people to know that that's how he feels about it, and yet at the same time understands that it's not everything L. Ron Hubbard said it was. L. Ron Hubbard was not everything he said he was. And, um, and the subject is not, has, has devolved into something under David Miscavige, which definitely should be stayed away from. He, he does make those points pretty clear in the book. So I can't really knock him for um, speaking his version of the truth, his idea of, of, of his life and his views on Scientology, and I don't, I don't begrudge him for any of that at all. There's not a lot of new information in the book in regards to Scientology or its abuses. Um, there's, you know, some new information in the book about David Miscavige, David Miscavige's life, um, some of his, er, you know, formative early years. It's interesting. It's very interesting stuff. Um, there's nothing really in the book about Shelley Miscavige. Uh, Ron was Ron claims that he was not really very close to them. Didn't know a lot about it. Didn't know she disappeared. That sort of thing. You know, it. it I wonder. I mean, it sort of strains my credulity a little bit that he was that hands off about it. But then again, 
you know, I, I, I can see how that could be that way. So I'm not, you know, I'm not calling them out or saying that, you know, that there, there should have been more or something like that. Not, not at all. If he didn't know, he didn't know. Um, and he also does um, uh, note, take, take some time to note that David Miscavige was even trying to con him a little bit at certain times, right? Because uh, Ron says that he was a gregarious talker up at the uh, Int base in science, for Scientology. He'd go around and he'd tell people things, he'd tell stories, he talks all the time. He is a talker. I know that from my own personal experience with him. And um, so a couple times David Miscavige tried to pull a fast one on him to try to get him to spread some rumors about David Miscavige and Ron kind of saw through him and that was, that was, kind, of, that was kind of funny. Um, I did ask, I put up, after I read the book, I put up on Facebook if anybody had any questions they wanted to, me to answer in this video. And so I got a few here, so I'm going to take those up. Was Ron RPF'd at any point? Did he go to the Rehabilitation Project Force or ever end up in the hole or something like that? And the answer is no, he did not. Um, there was a, a question about any new info or Shelley. There was also a question where they said, I'm curious as to how David Miscavige was even able to hand over $100,000 uh, when SO members in general are destitute. Um, and that the answer to that question is, is in the book, and it did because uh, Ron Miscavige Sr. asked his son after he had blown, after he took off from Scientology, he wrote to him and he said, you know, can you help me out at all? I'm out here in the real world now. And David Miscavige sent him $100,000. Apparently, that money came from an inheritance that David Miscavige got from Ron's ex-wife, Loretta. It didn't come from church money. So, that's good to know. Um, David Miscavige takes plenty from the church for his own lifestyle and his own life choices, and, uh, but he didn't apparently pass that on to Ron Miscavige, and, and I have no particular reason to, to question that or, or wonder if that's, about, if that's true or not. Um, one of the stories that, the, another question here is, what is DM's lifestyle and how is it perceived by others in the Sea Org? Um, I can tell you for myself, when I was in the Sea Org, that we thought Ron, that David Miscavige deserved everything he got. And we thought that he worked harder than any of us. And we thought that his nice suits and all that sort of thing were just something that were purchased by the Sea Org, you know. And, and I didn't know about his personal chef, personal groomer, personal this, personal that. I didn't know about any of that when I was in the Sea Org. But if I had, I would have thought, well, he's, you know, COB, so he deserves it. And that's kind of how Sea Org members view David Miscavige. Um, there was one story that Ron relates in the book where David Miscavige is, is in his office talking to Ron. And they're, you know, just talking about whatever. And somebody comes in and gives... David Miscavige, uh, his pay envelope, and it's got 50 bucks in it, just like everybody else gets, right? And I think Ron said that he thought that was staged for his benefit so that Ron would go around and tell everybody, hey, the guy just makes 50 bucks a week like the rest of us, right? But Ron Miscavige said, yeah, I didn't really fall for that. So um, there is that. Now there's a question here, maybe... Um, what your sense is about how hard he has tried to get through to his son, how far gone he thinks his son is, and how similar or different his experience is from that of other parents of Scientologists. Um, that's an, those are interesting points. I think that Ron Miscavige's um, experience with David as a Scientology parent before he got involved in Scientology is fairly typical. You know, he cares about his kids. He wants them to do well. Uh, Ron Miscavige bought into Scientology hook, line, and sinker, moving his family to England for a while in order to do services at St. Hill back in the 70s, and really diving in with both feet. So, um, so I don't know that that is actually very typical. I think most Scientologists as public don't get that far into it. Um, and then he let David Miscavige go off and join the Sea Org when he was 16 years old. That's pretty liberal, right? Um, the mother was, was kind of in shock. Loretta was, was kind of in shock about the whole thing. But Ron Miscavige is kind of like, yeah, well, that's what he wants to do. And he thought Scientology was good stuff. And, and of course, this is in 1976 or something, you know, way before uh, the Internet or any idea of what was really going on 
uh, with the C organization or with L. Ron Hubbard. So, you know, I don't know. It seemed to me that it was a bit, uh, pretty, pretty lot of latitude there that he gave to his kid. So I don't think that was a very typical experience, but, um, you know, that's that. Um, as far as getting through to his son and whatnot, I think he's definitely done as much as you could be expected to do. He talks about it in the book. And as far as his views of David Miscavige go, well, Ron Miscavige Sr. cites um, the book, The Sociopath Next Door. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty telling. Um, what is DM's Achilles heel? Now, this was asked to me on Facebook, and Dan Kuhn actually answered uh, his psychosis. And I actually could not agree more. I think that is exactly David Miscavige's Achilles heel, is he is um, not really capable of fully rational thought, as far as I can tell. That's my opinion, you know. But, um, but his, uh, his PR foot bullet ham-fisted approaches to silencing critics the, the, and his, his emphasis on the very worst of Scientology's policies, uh, such as disconnection and dead agenting and the fair gaming and all the rest, I think speak volumes about where his head's at. And these are the things that are bringing Scientology down. And you can go all the way back to, to my first videos on that, uh, where I talk about you know what's wrong with Scientology and why Scientology is destroying itself. And those videos um, basically relate the things that David Miscavige has emphasized about Scientology over the years that have made it its worst possible interpretation. Um, does the book go much into Scientology's disconnection policies? From my perspective, this is probably the most evil practice that Scientology engages in. Uh, yes, extensively and in detail. Um, and, on, um, and that is what this whole thing is all about, is the disconnection. That's what prompted, one of the key things that prompted Ron Miscavige Sr. to write this book in the first place, is he was disconnected from his own family, and he's the church leader's son, or father, rather, sorry. So, um, so that, that, again, that tells you quite a bit about just how far down uh, this organization has gone and, and how far gone David Miscavige is. And then what's it say about Lisa Marie Presley? Well, it says, it says a bit at the end. Uh, she's featured very prominently. And, um, and that's, you know, that's a very good thing that she's featured in there because she uh, played a role um, in trying to uh, help Ron Miscavige Sr. She played a big role. And, um, and as far as I'm concerned, she should have been on 2020 because she, uh, she was definitely going to bat for him. Um, so now I wanted to just end this by saying that I think his current press tour is going really well. Like I said, I saw him on Seth Andrews the other day and of course, you know, on 2020 and uh, Nightline, which was, um, you know, some people are saying that 2020 was, was really preempted a lot by Monique Yingling. Uh, that's true. I don't, I think that uh, maybe a third of that show was wasted time. Um, on Monique Yingling and, and others because um, they could have and should have uh, used a lot more of the footage about disconnection and the, the people who have been disconnected from that they had on there were given hardly any time. But as far as Ron Miscavige Sr. goes, I think he definitely had um, some good things to say on there and I think he came across well. I think he came across contrite and sincere and sympathetic and um, and he comes across that way in his other interviews, and I think he's doing a, doing a good job so far. And we'll see how this carries out. Hopefully he continues in that vein. Um, the main reason why I think that this is going to be successful is because it's focusing um, its talking points. Ron Miscavige is focusing his talking points on, on disconnection, um, which everybody can agree is a, is a horrible, awful thing. And also, he's talking about the endless fundraising nonsense that goes on, um, which, of course, you know, any of my viewers know about. And, um, and that he is um, you know, putting out there that, that Scientology is a sham at its upper levels, that, that it's all nonsense. He's not contributing at all to uh, any validity or credence to Xenu and, and that whole story and all that. So, so I think he's got some very good points that he's making, the very, very positive press points, and I think he'll do well as a result of that, and I think this book will do well as a result, too. So, well worth reading. It's not, not at all a waste of time for any Scientology watchers to read this book. You'll definitely learn things from it, 
and um, and I you know so I recommend it highly to everybody and it contributes to the to the the effort we're all engaged in here to uh, get rid of Scientology's uh, disconnection policies and its other crazy nonsense um, so there you go thank you for watching